You hear me? No. Now it works. So, a uh, good afternoon, all of you, and a uh, very warm welcome to uh, this seminar on resistance and resilience, fighting disinformation by democratic uh, means. My name is Anna Wieslander, and uh, I'm a director for Northern Europe at the Atlantic Council, and uh, heading the office at the Hathaway in Stockholm. And I wanted to start by mentioning a little bit about the Atlantic Council. I know several of you know what we do, but some uh, perhaps don't. Uh, uh, and some might have read in Aftonbladet recently that we are a new conservative American think tank uh, linked to NATO. I just want to say we are not. Uh, the Atlantic Council is non-partisan, opolitist. Uh, Swedish with no formal ties to NATO. We do believe, however, that uh, the world is better off if the US and Europe work together to address global challenges. And we also believe that the US is stronger with allies than without allies. So I want to take one minute and just show you a little bit about our work. <coughs> this works. And I get professional assistance here. Thank you. There we are, that's us. Uh, today's seminar takes place in a time uh, when disinformation is at the top of the agenda uh, around the globe. Over the last couple of years, a range of elections have become the targets of disinformation and so-called fake news. Reports of deceptive interference in electoral processes from external actors as well as disruptive national forces challenge key principles of open uh, and democratic societies. In Europe, we are soon uh, having European elections uh, to Parliament in May, and there is a string of uh, national elections. We have, uh, I think, Ukraine on Sunday, there are Lithuania, Finland, and so on, uh, during this year. And in the US, uh, there are preparations for the presidential elections in 2020 starting. So the purpose of this seminar is to highlight the pressure uh, that disinformation puts on democratic societies and to share experiences and methods that can facilitate easier identification of di disinformation. And we will do this in two sections. So first a lecture and then we will have a workshop. And the lecture is uh, on the record. Uh, it's also for questions we have uh, journalists among us so that you know. Uh, the core question, I think, that drove us to plan this seminar is how do we preserve our open societies in challenging times? And uh, I'm a political scientist and trained journalist myself, so I cannot miss this opportunity just to say a few words of the way I approach this, this topic. Uh, I believe that the key lies in good governance, in democratic governance. Uh, and we have developed that quite well, actually, in the physical space, the real space where we are day-to-day <laughs> -day, uh, handling issues. We started in Europe in the 17th century and onwards. Uh, 
We have uh, developed democratic and educationally. I think elementary school has been very important, not only to create the nation states that we have, the value grounds, but also to foster critically thinking citizens. And that is core for this. We have the development of the legislative system, uh, the role of parliaments in that regard, not least when it comes to accountability. Uh, women's participation in politics, grassroots movements, freedom of speech guaranteed, uh, a trustworthy and efficient judicial system, and the fight against corruption. I believe all of this is part of good governance. Uh, and we can see it now through the educational systems we have, uh, the judicial systems through the civil society, and even into cooperation with corporate governance. Uh, this is regulated, but less so in the digital space. Uh, sometimes we call it the Wild West still. Uh, we haven't really transformed what we have in the physical space to the digital space yet. And that makes it more vulnerable, uh, it makes it more accessible for disinformation uh, attempts. Uh, I, I, some of the problem, I think, arose that the, the introduction of the internet appeared uh, at a time when it was basically taken for granted that mechanisms worked in the way towards democracy and individual rights, that the internet would spur openness and transparency and that this would work to diminish the, the, the influence of authoritarian regimes. Um, it was a time when we had a, you know, a lot of faith in, in democracy as a system, it was spreading around the world. Uh, Francis Fukuyama talked about the end of history, it was the final system was democracy. Uh, but authoritarian regimes did not really accept this premise and uh, started to, to take control over the internet. So what we do have now is a tendency that authoritarian uh, regimes have more of a control uh, and governance over the internet than democracies have. And these tactics, tactics used are also used by non-state groups, uh, extremist groups, uh, to take control over the internet. But I think we should not be in despair. Uh, there are, we have mechanisms that we should be confident that we can transform into the digital space uh, using our lead works of openness, of participation, uh, accountability, um, transparency, and rule of law, and work our way to, to induce more of dem democracy into the digital space. So the Atlantic Council is very grateful uh, for the partnership we have had with the U.S. Embassy in preparing for this this workshop and making it happen. Thanks to Ambassador uh, Clifford Bond, uh, Chaché Fair, and to your team for very good cooperation. Uh, and I welcome you up, Ambassador, uh, to take the floor for some introductory remarks from your side. societies at present, and that's the issue of disinformation or the manipulation of information. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing our speaker, Ben Nemo, who's an expert on the subject. Uh, I, I, I will apologize to him uh, up front. I will have to leave before the end of the presentation. We have something we're doing up in Uppsala as well. But information is really the lifeblood of a democracy. When information is no longer trustworthy, it presents a very real threat to the foundation of democratic countries and democratic institutions. Of course, disinformation takes many forms, and I'm sure Mr. Nemo will discuss that. But its consistent intent is to muddy the debate, overwhelm target audiences, polarize politics, and poison public debate on many fundamental issues like good governance, free markets, and independent media, human rights, and democracy. The United States is actively working with our partners in Europe to identify, recognize, and expose disinformation, other malign influence, and such tactics, and to educate public publics on the dangers of misinformation. 
We are also increasing our efforts to promote accurate messages about the United States and our allies and partners in the pursuit of freedom, prosperity, and security. As stated in our U.S. national security strategy, and I paraphrase, we will continue to champion, champion American values and offer encouragement to those struggling for human dignity in their societies. There can be no moral equivalency between nations that uphold the rule of law and respect individual rights and those that brutalize and suppress their people. Through our words and our deeds, America must demonstrate a positive alternative to political and religious despotism. Healthy and robust public debate, based on facts, based on evidence and reason, are integral to a thriving democracy. I hope you'll have a very interesting and productive day. I'm encouraged by the fact that there are so many young people here in the room, that not just our old folkies that are going to be listening to these issues, and, and, and learning about some practical tools and applications to combat disinformation. Um, I think we all need to renew our commitment to protecting the fundamental principles on which our countries are, our two countries are founded. I want to thank Anna and her team at the Atlantic Council again for organizing today's event and for inviting me to say a few words. I have, when I was in Washington, a very productive and cooperative relationship with the Atlantic Council with individuals like John Herbst and uh, uh, Andrews Osland and, and, and others. And I appreciate the work it's doing throughout the, the North Atlantic community. So thank you very much. So it's time for me. Thank you very much for those words, Ambassador Bond. Uh, let me introduce our keynote speaker of today, Ben Nimmo. Ben is Senior Fellow for Information Defense uh, at the Atlantic Council. We have a Digital Forensic Research Lab, DFR Lab, who's working intensively with this. So this, this is the core of what we are sharing with you today. Ben specializes in analyzing patterns of online dis in disinformation and influence operations across varying platforms and geographical areas. In a career marked by more variety than predictability, he has been a scuba diving instructor, travel writer, journalist, and NATO press officer, and also worked for the Institute for Statecraft in London. And you just told me before that you have walked from, was it the north of Finland? Nurka. Nurka. And down to Sicily. Sicily. 19 months through Europe. So this is Ben Imo. I'm very glad to have you here, a great uh, colleague and a great colleague, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Anna, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a lot of you to go to Sverige again. I have had a lot of fun experiences here. I have shared a lot with Sverige. Och jag hoppas att ni kan tänka att jag är en, en vän till Sverige. Uh, ursäkta att jag talar inte bättre svenska. Uh, jag kommer att gå vidare på, på engelska. Men tack så mycket. Uh, I'll be talking about improving resilience against disinformation. Um, as Anna said, I'm Ben Nimmo. I'm on Twitter as at Ben Nimmo. Please note there's only one N in the middle. If there are any trolls watching the live stream, there's a guy out there who has two N's in the middle. Leave him alone. <laughs> Not his fault. I work at the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. We're a team of about 20 now, Lucas? More or less. Yeah, about, we're about 20 colleagues spread across seven or eight time zones, uh, and we study bad behavior on the internet, uh, which is a big subject, so it takes up all our time. Um, Anna has told you some of the opinions about me, um, other things that have been said about me. Uh, I'm the world's greatest Russophobe, according to uh, Russian state propaganda. Uh, I'm a paid propaganda hitman, they say. Uh, I've also been called a neocon warmongering globalist traitor. Uh, and allegedly, I'm dead. <laughs> I was declared dead by an angry Russian bot herder in 2017. So take your pick about what you believe by the end of this session. Um, if you still think I'm dead at the end of it, then I need more coffee. <laughs> 
I will be talking today mainly about disinformation and propaganda. Now, the, these are two terms which get thrown about a lot. They do actually each have a precise definition, so just for clarity, the difference between the two when I'm talking about them, disinformation is deliberately spreading false information. So if you are going to call something out as a piece of disinformation, you have to prove two things. You have to prove that it was false, and you have to prove that it was deliberate. So it's a very precise word to be using. Propaganda, by contrast, is using information to exert influence. Now, propaganda can be true or false, and some of the most effective propaganda campaigns in history have been true. So if I call something propaganda, I'm not making a value judgment on the actual factual accuracy of the claim. It's about the intent. So those are the words I'll be working with a lot today. Now, if you think back, those of you who are old enough to remember this, think back 15 or 20 years ago, you know, we'd had the Stone Age, we'd had the Bronze Age, we'd had the Iron Age, and now we were in the Information Age. We'd got things called computers and the internet, and they were wonderful, and we were gonna spread more knowledge to more people than any time in history before. Uh, fast forward to 2019, and we are in the Disinformation Age. More people are being exposed to more disinformation than ever before. Um, there's a saying, that if you, if you look at the kind of technological revolutions we've had in the last 20 years, we've had the revolution in online publishing, it's easier to create a convincing looking document or a convincing looking story than ever before. We've had the rise of social media, so once you've created your convincing looking document, you can spread it through all different channels and get it to reach millions of different people. And we're seeing attacks on the press. We are seeing more attacks on the press from more authoritarian leaders and would-be authoritarian leaders than we have for a very long time. The press play a vital role. They show when the leaders are doing bad things. Leaders don't like having that shown up. If you put those together, there's always been the saying that the lie can go around the world faster than the truth can put its boots on, right? Right now, the lie is going around the world and somebody has set the truth on fire. So we are in the disinformation age. That's the scary bit. The important thing to remember, this is not actually something new. And if we talk about resilience in societies, we need to bear in mind that societies have been through this cycle many times before in history. Does anybody recognize that illustration out of interest? So this is the Nama palette. This is the, the founding document of the Kingdom of Ancient Egypt. It dates to about 3200 BC. It demonstrates the moment where, where King Nama, or, or Menes, the big guy in the middle, united the two halves of Egypt into a single kingdom. It's about 5200 years old, and it is a piece of propaganda. Was he really a giant war hero who smoked his enemies in person? We don't know. That is state propaganda. It's all about giving the message the king, blessed by the gods, is now in charge. And if you disagree, he will beat your brains out with a stick. It's pretty basic propaganda messaging. Five and a half thousand years old. Interesting point to note, the discipline of history, as we know it, as created by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, is 2,500 years old. Propaganda is twice as old as history. It's been there longer than history itself. That is propaganda in stone carving. This is the printing press. The printing press was invented in the late 15th century and created an information revolution. It was a wonderful thing. It was going to bring more information to more people than ever before. People were going to be able to print Bibles and the Greek classics and the Roman classics. It was the information revolution of its time. Then along comes Martin Luther, decides he doesn't like the way the Catholic Church is doing things, and he started using the printing press as his heavy artillery. He printed more than 6,000 tracts in his lifetime. It triggered a war of pamphlets across Europe. And what had been an information revolution became a disinformation revolution. And then, gradually, over the succeeding centuries, such societies which had been through this shock, including things like the Thirty Years' War, started working out what the rules were, and what are the parameters. Should you actually trust a piece of paper which doesn't even have the name of the author or the publisher on it? Should it be legal to publish something without saying where the publisher is based? These were the basic building blocks fighting back against disinformation in the printing press. Fast forward to the 1930s, radio. This chap used radio a lot. 
And it, the idea was that you can now reach, you don't have to go through the medium of the published word anymore. You don't have to go through the publisher or the newspaper. You can reach people in their own houses. This may sound familiar to those dealing with social media. The idea of radio back in the day was the same. You can reach straight into people's houses and give them your message from the leader without the intermediary of the media themselves. So again, radio comes in. Technological revolution, information revolution, followed by disinformation revolution. And now jumping forward to 2016, these are social media posts from Tennessee GOP. Those of you who deal with the Russia patch will know TechCop. Tennessee GOP is an old friend. Uh, it claimed to be the unofficial Twitter account of the Republican Party in Tennessee. It was run from the Troll Factory in St. Petersburg. It was posting directly to Americans, pretending to be an American, attacking Hillary Clinton. So that's TechCop. This is a Russian information operation masquerading as Americans. This is a Facebook page called No Racism, No War, which is boasting about how it's just voted for Beto O'Rourke. This was run by an Iranian information operation masquerading as Americans. This uh, is a collection of about 100 profile pictures of a, of a, this is a small section of a very large botnet, of a, a network of automated accounts on Twitter, which I discovered last year. All these accounts, as far as we can tell, were run by a commercial Russian operator working out of St. Petersburg again. Not part of the troll factory, not as far as we know related to the Russian state, just running bots for money. There are all the different ways of reaching into people's homes, but the bottom line is, we have had an information revolution. The bad actors are trying to turn it into a disinformation revolution. Our job and our challenge is to get the information back. It's to teach people how to navigate and survive in this new world as we move from the, oh, it's on the internet, so it must be true, to maybe we should think about this first. And beyond that, there's another challenge, and particularly for the communicators in the room, for the government people in the room, this is the really big challenge that people have not yet grasped. About the, 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 the terminology for this challenge changes every six months. When I was starting out as an analyst, people were talking about information warfare a lot. It's still talked about. But when you think about what we're actually dealing with, is it information warfare or is it narrative warfare? The bad guys don't have better, better facts than us. They have stories. We are being attacked by weaponized stories. And stories are much easier to make up when you get rid of the whole idea of, well, we have to tell the truth. Once you accept as a disinformation actor that you can lie about absolutely everything, then all kinds of options open up. So the challenge we are facing is the attacks that are coming, not just from Russia, but from authoritarian actors, from extremist groups. They're telling a good story. They're speaking to fear and anger and trying to disempower people. They're trying to make people so angry and so scared that they stop thinking. And once they stop thinking, they've got you. Oh, the migrants are coming to rape your daughters and burn your houses. That is a terrifying message to be pushing forward. And once you're terrified, your brain doesn't work anymore. The challenge that civil society faces, that Western governments face, that the open source community faces, we can't speak to fear and anger in return. We can't use the same emotions. In the open source community, we have to speak to other emotions, positive emotions, like interest, and curiosity, and we need to seek to empower people. And when you're talking about resilience in a society, you're talking about the ability to give your own people the power to do this themselves. If we remain stuck in a mindset where it's going to be government deals with disinformation and the people just say thank you, it's never going to work. The people are the targets of disinformation, they have to be the ones who spot it for themselves. The good thing is that it's actually possible to teach people how to do this, and it's even possible to make it fun. I was just discussing with Lucas just now. All of those of us who work in this field started out as hobbyists. The, 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 the leader of this field, the greatest guy in, in, in the field, is Elliot Higgins of Bellingcat. He started out blogging from, his, from his, his sofa at home just because it was interesting, and he got more and more interested in what he was finding, and became more and more expert, and now he is the world expert in this field. And the way we can think of this, the kind of job we do, and the kind of the way to expose disinformation, which, which in my experience works, you model yourself on a detective story. This is a quote from an English fiction writer called Gladys Mitchell. 
a problem has been set before him and the reader obtains pleasure from doing his best to solve it, there's a real thrill in trying to catch out Gladys Mitchell or Agatha Christie. Can you do it as well as Edmund Powell? Can you be as clever as Miss Marvel? But the rule is that every clue must be placed fairly before the reader. You've got to give the reader the chance to work this out for themselves. And in real life, once the reader gets it one time, they can go and do it a hundred times on their own. They don't need you there anymore to say, this is how you do it. They know how to do it. And if you think about, let's say, an Hercule Poirot story, there's three things which make up the mystery. Who done it? Why did they do it? And how did they do it? But if you think about the experience of reading an Agatha Christie novel, certainly for me, the most interesting bit is always that final chapter. So in the, in the, in the last but one chapter, Hercule Poirot comes out and says, these things that I know done it, it was you. Right, and his, his eyes glow green like a cat, and it's all very dramatic. And you immediately turn the page. Because you're going, what? Hastings? How? How can it have been Hastings? It's the how that is really important. You want to know how was the trick done. If you're the storyteller, you want to show people how the trick was done. And if you show people how, then they can replicate it themselves. They can do it again. And so, Sharing the how is such an important part of this whole challenge. It's not just telling people that's disinformation. It's somebody's trying to fool you. They're playing a trick on you. Here's how the trick is done. Here's how to watch out for it next time. So I will talk through some of the how that we have developed at BFR Lab. I'll talk about predicting disinformation, understanding networks that spread it, Identifying fake engagement on the different platforms. Identifying recycled images. And about telling the story. These are all skills that we've learned by doing it the hard way. But the hopeful thing is they're not that difficult. If they were really complicated, there wouldn't be so many people working on this. And so, here are, what I will tell you now is some basic techniques that we use, that you can use, that frankly anybody can use. But it will help to, to break down this big complicated problem and make it into manageable parts. So the first one, and, and really my first contribution to this field, predicting disinformation. I was a press officer at NATO for three and a half years dealing with Russia and Ukraine. So 2014 was a very interesting year for me. By the end of 2014, I'd be sitting there with the colleagues and another blast of Russian disinfo would come out and we'd be saying, oh God, that's so predictable. And it was predictable. So then I thought, well, if it's predictable, we must be able to predict it. How do you predict Russian disinformation? And so I came out with a predictive model, which I call the four Ds. It is only fair to point out that since I published this model, I've seen it applied analytically to many other people. The Chinese have used it in the South China Sea. Um, Iranian propaganda has used it. Both sides in the Brexit debate were seen using it at various times. So this seems to be a fairly standard international model of how disinformation works. And it's got four parts which are dismiss, distort, distract, and dismay. These are, these are really the building blocks of propaganda, the building blocks of disinfo, and you can use them to predict and to expose this kind of activity. Dismiss is the most frequently used, particularly on the Russian side, uh, and it, is, it, it consists of just insulting whoever's criticizing you. So, so uh, Russian state TV have called me the world's greatest Russophobe because if you say, hey, he's a Russophobe, don't listen to him. The important thing is that second bit, don't listen to him. Depending on the subject, oh, they're Al-Qaeda, don't listen to them. Oh, they're CIA, don't listen to them. They're Al-Qaeda and CIA, go figure, don't listen to them. One of my favorite cases is this one. This was a tweet from the Russian embassy in South Africa, which is a troll embassy, quite frankly. Um, 2017, Morgan Freeman, the actor, fronts a video saying that Russia has interfered in the US election. On the record, yes, they did. Um, the Russian embassy in South Africa puts out a meme saying, Morgan Freeman says that Russia interfered in the US election. Morgan Freeman also says he loves marijuana. Is it even worth listening to him? That's what that meme says, right there. Is it worth listening to him? That is the classic dismiss technique. Don't listen to him, and therefore ignore all the evidence he's bringing you forth. So that's dismiss. Distort is where if the story that you're attacking isn't scary enough or dramatic enough, you just twist the facts. There are cases where, for example, the Russian Ministry of Defense has been caught photoshopping imagery to try to blame Ukraine for shooting an Malaysian Airlines flight MH17. 
distorting the actual evidence. Sometimes it's a verbal distortion, um, and sometimes it's a case like this, where a uh, pro-Kremlin site of the Donbass in early 2017 accused the US of sending 3,600 tanks against NATO. Uh, the actual figure was 180 tanks, but 180 tanks isn't a particularly good headline, so you just multiply it by 20, and then you have a scary number, okay? This was deliberate disinformation. Distraction. Um, for those of you who do Soviet studies or know the Soviet background, this is the old what about -ism. And it basically consists of throwing out as many different accusations as you can just to try and confuse people to make people give up. So again, for example, on MH17, we have RT reporting that, well, an Israeli main air to air missile may have died at MH17. Or a Ukrainian Su-25 fighter was detected in close approach to MH17 just before the crash. Or even, it may be a CIA false flag. All different pieces covered by the same Kremlin propaganda adept. None of them actually focusing on the fact that, well, all the open source evidence points to the fact that it was the 53rd Anti-Aircraft Brigade from Kursk which did the shooting down. It's a distraction technique. It puts you on the defensive, it puts you on the back foot, and as soon as you're talking about, that wasn't the CIA, you're crazy. You're not talking about what actually happened. So dismiss, distort, and distract. And the final tactic is dismay. This is the one which is the least used um, because it consists of going nuclear in the rhetorical sense. Um, for example, when Denmark, just next door, was talking about contributing one missile frigate, one radar frigate, in fact, to NATO's missile defense, uh, the Russian ambassador to Denmark did an interview with the Jelans Poster saying that, well, if you do that, we'll have to put you on the nuclear strike list. That being said, while the Danish parliament is debating the proposal, it's going nuclear in a rhetorical sense to try and terrify people so they will change their policy. Norway has been threatened that if they accept 300 US Marines on their territory, they'll be on the nuclear strike list. Who knew that the US Marines were so terrifying? But dismiss, distort, distract, and dismay are the four elements of disinformation. You can use it to predict disinformation. You can use it to explain disinformation to people. You can also use it to get through a very long and boring Bloody good Putin press conference at the end of the year. You have a little list with the 40s and you can tick them off and you give him marks at the end. And it does make it so much easier to sit through. So that's the 40s. That's how the message is created. Then the question becomes how does it get spread? How does this information get from the government or the actor who's creating it down to the actual people they're targeting? In the case of the Russian Federation, particularly, there's what you can think of as a full spectrum model which includes trolls, bots, unofficial propaganda sites, official propaganda sites, and diplomats and officials and state employees, all doing the same thing, all saying the same thing, but pretending they're all independent. Purely as an aside, again, a little bit of terminology, quite a lot of people get confused, confused about trolls and bots. When I talk about it, a troll is a human being, albeit probably a fairly nasty one, spends their time on the internet sending abusive messages. They normally post high rates of content because they're doing it all the time, but they write their own posts. You can have an argument with a troll. Sometimes you can actually have a conversation with them. The conversation is not really what they're interested in. But a troll is a human being. You compare that with a bot. A bot is an automated account. It's run by an algorithm. It posts very high rates of content. I'll show you later on there's a bot I found which posted 2,400 times in one day. They typically post retweets, likes, or follows. They typically don't write their own posts. So if you're having a long and intensive argument about the policy of a particular politician in your country with an unknown Twitter account, it's not going to be a bot. It will be a troll. So that's just a little bit of clarity, okay? Trolls are humans, bots are automation. The way the Russian system works is you have officials RT and Sputnik, which I classify as propaganda outlets, troll farms, validators, covert sites, diplomats, and GRU, military intelligence, all working together to create a strategic effect or to push a particular narrative. And there's an example of, the, of all these different pieces in action together from July 2016 and the targeting of the World Anti-Doping Agency. And this is a particularly striking story because what had happened was in July 2016, WADA came out and said, we have evidence of Russian state-sponsored doping. 
that if the Russian state is interfering with the doping checks on a massive scale. Now, if you think of that in terms of headlines, it's a big scandalous story, in terms of actual national security policy for Russia, there's no way in which this was a national security threat. Russia was in no way under any kind, in any kind of economic or, or, or geopolitical danger because of this. It's just, it was really embarrassing for the Russian government because they boasted about how great, if they rebuilt Russia's sporting pride. So this was purely a political <coughs> problem for the Russian government, which is then interesting because the next thing that happens is these guys get turned on the case. These are four GRU, Russian military intelligence hackers. The photo is from when they were arrested in the Netherlands in April last year, okay? They were deployed to Rio de Janeiro, which was a hardship posting, to go and hack into WADA. And then they started leaking what they found. Now, this is military intelligence. They're being turned loose because something politically embarrassing has happened to the Russian government. That's quite illuminating itself. Sure enough, in September 2016, unknown hackers calling themselves Fancy Bear started leaking online documents hacked from WADA which showed that American sports stars had been given therapeutic use exemptions. They'd been allowed to use banned substances for medical reasons. WADA confirmed that they had been hacked. What's interesting, therapeutic use exemptions are entirely legal. You can question exactly how they get handed out, but if you've got an exemption, by definition, you're not cheating. Here's what Vladimir Putin said. I shall summarize. We don't like hackers much, but it's thanks to them we know that actually everybody's doping. Why did Russians get banned? This was clearly a dishonest, hypocritical, and cowardly decision. Now focus on that word hypocritical, okay? That's Putin addressing athletes. So this is a message right from the top. Banning Russia was hypocritical. Welcome to Sputnik. Leaked documents expose US athletics hypocrisy. RT, Russian Olympic athletes confront the world of hypocrisy. The Russian Embassy UK is tweeting about hypocrisy. It's almost like somebody's told them what to say. Isn't that strange? Here's an interesting one. This is an outlet called the Newsfront, uh, which claims to be independent. Uh, posts largely anti-Western program and anti-Ukrainian content. According to a whistleblower interviewed by Deep Sight uh, two years ago, they're funded by Russian intelligence as well. And here they're running a, sen a, a sensational story on Americans using doping. Bolt News claims to be independent. Investigative journalists in Latvia prove that it's actually owned by the Russia Subordinate News Agency, which also runs Sputnik. And again, they're focusing on these doping claims against US athletes. So you've got the, the president, the embassy, the propaganda channels, the covert propaganda channels. It gets interesting when you have Sputnik interviewing a, a, a so-called expert in the US who's saying, why do these change the rules? And Sputnik is adding in double standards, hypocrisy by another word. It's twisting the story and presenting it along the same narrative again. And then you get this post, I thought what, it was supposed to fight the use of doping, not encourage it, which is a tweet that comes from the troll factory in St. Petersburg. You've gone every step of the way from the president down to the troll farm, they're all saying the same thing at the same time on message. That is the way that the full spectrum approach works. And once you teach people to look out for that, they can actually look for the cross-references themselves. They can see when RT is saying exactly the same thing as the embassy is saying exactly the same thing as the troll farm. You can teach people, you can give people a map. This is how it works. This is how it fits together. Next time, you can recognize it yourself. Another useful trick to teach people, spotting bots. There's a lot of talk about automated accounts on social media, particularly Twitter, but they're across platforms, and the impact they can have on a debate. Botnets Large clusters of bots can come in their thousands. The, the largest one that I've personally encountered had 200,000 accounts in it. And that's a medium-sized network. So these are very, very large-scale operations. You can't spot them all as an individual. If you can teach 200,000 people to spot bots, then you've actually got a chance of finding them all. And it's a very easy method that you can teach people. You look for three things. We've had the four Ds. Here come the three A's. Activity, anonymity, 
and amplification. You look for how often an account is posting. Is it posting one or two times a day, or is it posting 100 or 200 times a day? You look for anonymity. Does it actually have a profile picture at all? Does it have a real name at all? Does it give away any kind of information that there's a real person behind this account? And then you look for amplification. You look at the account and you see what it's posting. The idea of social media is that people are social. They put out their opinions and their own ideas. If you find an account which all it's doing is retweeting other people or sharing other people's websites, it seems to have no opinion of its own. And all you do is you just keep on scrolling down the list. You keep on scrolling down the profile of an account to see whether it's ever actually posted what looks like authored content, or is it always just amplifying other people's content. An example is this account here, which I found a few days back posting about politics in India. Um, there's a useful platform called Twitonomy, where you can, if you enter a, a Twitter handle into it, it will give you this kind of breakdown of the account. So this is an open source tool which I used on this one, just to give you a flavor for it. So, I don't know if you can read that there, but on one day, on the 10th of February, 2019, that account posted 2,453 times in one day. You do the maths on that, that's about one post every 40 seconds from midnight through to midnight. He did not stop for Fika. <laughs> just kept going. That is bot-like behavior, right? If you look at the actual content, 98% of that content was retweets. So of those 2,453 posts, they're almost all retweets. That's somebody who's saying an awful lot without saying anything of their own. And then looking at the profile picture, it's a cartoon. It doesn't give any kind of verifiable personal information. Here you have activity, anonymity, and amplification. That is a bot. Now, you can teach people to use that, that particular triage. You don't need complicated methodology to do it. All you do is you look at it and you say, okay, if he's posting 2,000 times a day, I don't think that's a real person. You can do similar things on the other platforms. One of my four more enjoyable stories was um, we were monitoring the Mexican election last year. And as part of the election, we kept on seeing stories about the self-styled king of fake news in Mexico who was boasting about how good he was at making things trend on social media. And this struck us as weird, because frankly, if you're really the king of fake news, then the last thing you do is boast about it, because then you get taken down. So real kings of fake news tend to shut up. So we thought we'd have a look at this guy, and his company had its own Facebook page. So we thought we'd look at the Facebook page, and there were lots of posts like this where he's basically showing off um, articles about himself. But the interesting thing on this particular post, and again, we're doing this purely by eyeball, we're not using complicated ninja techniques, because we're not complicated ninjas. If you look at this post here, he's got 2,800 likes, you know, the thumbs up. He's not got any other sort of reaction at all. You'd think that out of 2,800 reactions, at least one person would do a love, or a laughing face, or maybe even an angry face, right? So you look at that, we look at that, and we just thought, that, that, that doesn't happen. That does not happen in real life. It does happen if you've paid for a provider to give you 2,800 likes, because then they do what you ask. So this looked awfully like false amplification, but we weren't sure. So then we looked at some of the accounts which are doing the liking. Now bear in mind that this is a Mexican entrepreneur who is boasting about his Mexican operation in Mexican Spanish. So why were all the accounts that liked him Brazilian Portuguese? One or two would make sense, right? People are interested in all kinds of weird stuff. 2,800 of them does not make sense. This started to look really, really dodgy. And so we started looking at some of the Brazilian accounts which were doing the liking. And they, they all had something in common. They all had these letters, PCSD, somewhere in the profile or the bio or the background. And so we started searching on Facebook for what PCSD was. And what we found was posts like this. PCSD was an organized group where people would post bank receipts, I've anonymized it, and they would say, here is the receipt for selling a page for dollars. Okay, this was an online engagement market. You pay them the money and you get the amplification. Another example we found, on the left, we have a, um, a screenshot again that they've posted saying, here's the client saying, can you please share my post and add the legend, que texto, what a great text. On the right, 
you have the share, K Textor. And in the middle, you have his post saying, proof of purchase, the screenshot is following, the type of purchase, a share for money. Okay, so this was a network which was selling engagement for money. And they had 2,800 likes from this network, from our Brazilian, from our Mexican King of Fake News. Conclusion we came to, our King of Fake News wasn't a King of Fake News at all. He was a fake King of Fake News. He was charging politicians in Mexico hundreds of thousands of dollars a month to make them trend. And then he was getting them to trend by buying in engagement from Brazil and from India. And the thing is, on the Brazilian network, their going rate was 10,000 likes on Instagram for $60. So our Mexican King of Fake News was making a fortune by pretending it was more expensive than it really was. But we exposed all that just by looking at the posts and thinking, yeah, why are 2,800 Brazilians liking a Mexican post? That's the kind of thing you can teach people to look for. And some people think it's cool. Some people think they're geeks, it happens. Some people think it's cool and they go and do the same thing. Another really simple trick that you can teach people is reverse searching an image. How many people here know how to reverse search an image? Yeah, some? Okay, so reverse searching is a really neat trick, um, particularly if you're, if you're browsing in Google Chrome, because then it's a single click. What you do is, this image here, incidentally, was posted on the 1st of October 2017, which was the day of the referendum in Catalonia. And it says that it, it's, it's, it's noble and brave Catalan firefighters um, going up against the police to protect the vote on the 1st of October. But note the date, right? 1st of October 2017. This is meant to be happening that day. If you use Google Chrome and right click on the image, you get this option here search Google for the image. If you click on that, it shows you all the times that image has been used. The neat thing is you can then if you go to the, um, go to the tool section here, it gives you an option to sort by size, so you can find the biggest one, which is usually the first one, and you can sort by date. And I sorted that search to the 1st of September 2017. And lo and behold, that's how much news footage there was of that particular photo a month before the referendum. That's because that was an incident which had happened three years before. So somebody had simply taken the photo, repurposed it to say, this is happening today, and stuck it online. That's the kind of thing we come across all the time, particularly in an election context. That's a context, if any of you are busy with monitoring elections, get used to reverse search and imagery, because the single biggest problem you will have on election day, people will start posting imagery of election fraud. Quite often it's from a different country on a different continent. You need to be able to prove that. And you can actually have a really big impact just with little techniques like this. Uh, in September 2017, a colleague and I were monitoring the German election, and we were looking for all kinds of malign online behavior. We found this advert, which is an advert for the, um, the IFD, the, the, the anti-migrant party, the anti-EU party in Germany, um, and it's referencing the New Year's sex attacks by migrants on Germans in Cologne in 2016. Uh, and the, the, the logo is just, do you remember New Year? Only we looked at this image, we thought there's something wrong. Look how sharp that shadow is there. Look how bright the light is there. And you compare it with the faces behind. That looks like a photoshopped image. It just doesn't add up. So we reverse searched it. And what we found was that image. Note the faces in the background. It's an identical match, right? The only thing which is different is the head. This is meant to be Cologne, 2016. The original is CBS journalist Lara Logan on Tahrir Square in Cairo in 2011. Okay? So there we already have half the story. We know that the IFD is using an image which has been photoshopped, not necessarily by them, to make migrants look more scary. So we thought that's half the story. Wouldn't it be interesting to find out where that head shot originally came from? And so the great thing is because this is, this is a geek subject, there are people who think it's really, really cool. So my colleague decided to crowdsource it, and he posted this tweet saying, we're trying to work out who this is, can you help? There are all kinds of experts out there in the world. Some of them are experts on blondes. Because within about an hour, we had the URL. Somebody sent it in, that this is where it is. We looked at the image, and there it was. See the match? But when we reverse searched that one for the origin, we couldn't find it. So we flipped the image, we just turned it around, we 
we reverse searched that, and what we found was a Spanish language edition of For Him magazine for gentlemen. <laughs> so now we have the story, and the story is that the IFD is using an election poster which is based off Tahrir Square in 2011 and a Spanish language edition of a gentleman's magazine. All that done just by reverse searching and asking the, the blonde expert community, where does this headshot come from? That story was the front page on Build Cycle the day before the election. But IFD had to apologize for using Photoshop imagery and they had to explain. Reverse searching is a really small skill, but when you find the bad stuff, it's really important. Another story, because again the point is, what's important here is not actually very, very high levels of technical skill, it's actually the curiosity and the interest and the ability to do the basic stuff. I'm going to take you on a cruise to the Black Sea. Um, and it's a cruise on the USS Donald Cook, which is uh, one of the United States' top missile defense cruisers. So it's a luxury cruise. But unfortunately, it's in a dodgy neighborhood because in 2014, the Cook had a very close flyby by a Russian fighter. And this caused some international incident at the time. Um, three years later, in 2017, Russian state TV ran out a sensational argument, an article about that incident. And their story was that Russia not had America's <laughs> finest missile cruiser. This was a huge story on Russian state TV. And it was on Pyotr Canal, like the main channel in Russia. The story, as Pyotr Canal told it, was based on, if you, those who can read Russian, a letter from the Donald Cook. And in fact, in the, in the article themselves, it's like a seven minute TV clip, they actually referenced a social media post from an American sailor who had been on board at the time. And this is their sole source. Their claim was that the Russian fighter had flown past the cook, switched on the electronic jamming, and knocked out the entire ship. Their only source was the social media post. And rather helpfully, they gave the source in Russian for their own viewers, and then in English for everybody else. We watched the Russian on our locator until he reached the kill zone to then shoot him down. But when he entered the damn zone, the mysticism began. Our locators were the first to go out, and then the whole Aegis went out. The pride of our fleet became our shame. I'm sure those of you who know American sailors will testify that they all talk like that all the time, right? <laughs> this just reeked of being bogus. So we thought, right, this looks like a, this looked like a made-up story. How do we prove it? How do we work out where this came from? Now, the origin of the article is meant to be a social media post from a sailor on board the cook. You look at it and you think, that's too long for a tweet, right? We're not going to fit that in a single tweet. So let's start off looking on Facebook. How do you search for something like that on Facebook? Well, as it happens, rather usefully, it's got a really, really unique set of search terms. Aegis, locator, mysticism, and shame. You're not going to get many random hits with that. So we stuck it into Facebook. And sure enough, we got a batch of, of, um, of hits from April 2014, which is when the, the incident was meant to have happened. And weirdly, they were all very much the same wording. So we scrolled back down to the bottom of the list, and we found the origin, which was Gimli the Dwarf from Lord of the Rings, writing to my favorite Mary again, obviously the way a US sailor would speak. Um, so, so yeah, started reading this and then started laughing. Uh, but the interesting thing, if you look through, about halfway down you get this paragraph. You have mysticism, you have locators, you have aegis, and you have shame. All our hits are here. This is clearly the same story. It's talking about the Donald Cook. But it's not the same wording. It's a variation on the wording of the Russian state piece. So this English language text here, unless the Russian state is mistranslating, is not actually the original. It's almost like it's a parallel translation of the same text. And then if you look at the very end of the post, you see that that's because it is a translation of a parallel text. Because actually the original is a byliner in Russian by a guy called Dmitry Sidov, writing for the Fund for Strategic Culture in Russia, which is another well-known program in sight. Um, and it's a spoof piece. It's an opinion piece. This was, it, this, it, it's like the Russian version of The Onion. This is him writing what he would have thought an American sailor might have said if this had actually happened back in 2014. 
And if you want verification, I mean, look, look up here, right? To hell with them with their money. Better you buy a small farm in Arizona, grow celery for sale, and sing songs in church on Sundays. It's a wind-up. But then you jump to Russian state TV, and you compare their Russian language text with the Russian language spoof piece and it's such an identical match that you even see where Russian state TV has put in the ellipses where it's missed out a few words, there and there. So that story about Russia knocks out an American ship, this is the actual story. The Russian state TV uses an online fake to lie about a US missile cruiser. That was the story. That was a big story to tell. Russian state TV are very unhappy about us telling that story. It was a total fake, and it was just coming from reading the post and thinking, that doesn't fit, and then finding the unique search terms. You can teach people how to do this. It's not difficult. It just requires the mentality. And so much of what we see as, as the need for resilience is teaching people the mentality. You empower the reader. You teach them the tricks. Then you let them solve the puzzles. On one occasion, I actually taught a class of nine-year-olds how to do a reverse search. And some of them went home and their parents told me the next day, he spent the whole evening reverse searching Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. But you can teach people these skills and they stick. And behind that, it teaches them the mentality. That's a group of nine-year-olds who, whenever they get a message or they see somebody on social media that they don't recognize, their first instinct is now, let's reverse search the image. Oh look, it's a stock picture where 300 accounts have the same profile picture. That's a child who is going to be harder to fool with a fake account. So there's really a value to teaching them the simple stuff. Final example, and then I'll shut up. Um, I'll take your questions. It's also really important to do this because there are times when you don't even know what you're sitting on until something big hits, and then you suddenly realize you've actually got the story in your hand which is going to change the whole news cycle. And a lot of the resilience is actually knowing what you're working with, knowing the actors in the field, so that when something blows up, you're already familiar with the situation. And the classic example was in early 2017, we were doing a lot of study of the far right internationally. Um, this, is, this is post Donald Trump's election, there's a surge in far right sentiment. We started studying some of the different sorts of traffic that were going on. As part of that, we saw this account whose handle was Messmer, with three S's in the middle of it. This was the leader of a far-right group in France on Twitter who were absolutely brilliant at getting their hashtags to trend. They were one of the most sophisticated groups you've ever seen. They were so sophisticated that we did an article on, you know, here's the kind of small online army, this is how they work. We did an article on it, we put it to one side. Entirely unrelatedly, we came across this guy, Jack Pesorgitz, who's a self-styled Slav right activist in the US. Um, we noticed it because he was weird. He's boasting about reading the Principles of Geopolitics by Alexander Dukin, who is Vladimir Putin's favorite philosopher. We noticed it and thought, why, why is an American far-right activist reading Dukin? It seemed a bit odd. We ended up not doing a story on it, but we just noted it, Jack the Soviet's guy who reads Dukin, and we moved on. Separately, again, we found a far-right outlet in the US called Disobedient Media, probably better known as Disinformation Media, um, probably the most ham-fisted ham and clumsy propaganda out that I have ever, ever seen. Really, really incompetent, um, but they had some quite interesting amplification on Reddit. And so we did a story about how they were being spread around online and, and how Reddit was an important part. So we've got three different unrelated actors, two of them we reported on, the other we thought, well, it's there, that's fine. Uh, and then we moved on. And then came Macronics. May the 5th, 2017, 36 out, hours out from the French presidential election second round, where you have Emmanuel Macron against Marine Le Pen. I got a phone call about 10 in the evening from Reuters saying, the hashtag Macron leaks just started trending. Somebody has dumped 9 gigabit bytes of emails from Macron's campaign. Can you tell us what's going on? Now, this is where having the software does come in handy. I ran a software scan on traffic on the hashtag Macron leaks and saw, you know, this was the pattern, you've got a few spikes here and here. Overall, you have 46,000 tweets on the hashtag in three hours. That's not actually very much. Um, when Donald Trump uh, tweeted that wonderful word, he had 100,000 mentions in 41 minutes. 
So 46,000 tweets in three hours, it's, it's modest traffic, but it's not massive. One of the things that the software does is it breaks down who are the users who are getting most mentioned in a scan, who's most influential in this conversation. And so I pulled up that page and I went, hallelujah, because the top four, number one was WikiLeaks. Well, I think by 2017, most of us knew about WikiLeaks, right? Number two was Jack Posobiec. Well, that's the far right guy in America who reads Dugan. Number three was Mess. Mayor. Well, that's the leader of the far-right group in France that we've studied. Number four was Disobedient News. That's the Disinformation Channel. So, purely by looking at this, these are the accounts which are getting most mentioned in the whole track on Macronics. So, immediately, I just read through that and I knew, okay, we're in the world of the far-right. It's the far-right which is pushing this, and we've got the American far-right, and the French far right. So the question then became, who moved first? Where did this hashtag start? And so scanning back and back and back through the scan, you come to the first tweet, and it was this one. The very first tweet to use Macron leaks in this context was from Jack Vesogates in the US. And look at the timestamp, 7.49 in the evening. That's US time, instead. Next we have, sorry, no, that's European time. Next we have WikiLeaks. 40 minutes later. Interesting sidelight here. WikiLeaks post, post online the entire archive, right? So they're putting all the leaks online themselves with the message, this could be a practical joke. So this is WikiLeaks saying, hey, here's 9 gigabytes of emails. We don't know if they're true or false, but we're going to publicize them anyway right now. Do we think that's a bona fide error of judgment, or do we think that is WikiLeaks trying to interfere in the French election? You choose. Okay? But that's 8.31 p.m. One hour and one minute later, you get the red alert from our French far-right friend that WikiLeaks has published the emails from Macron campaign. So just by looking at that, we were able to say, with 100% certainty, wherever the leaks came from, they were pushed online by the far right of the United States, then they were amplified by WikiLeaks, and only then did they reach the French far right. So this was a far right American intervention in the French debate. Regardless of who actually did the leaking to start with, the Twitter traffic was the American far right interfering in France. So I was able to phone back Reuters and say, yes, as it happens, I do have something to tell you about Macronics. This was the Reuters story overnight. This would have been about 3 o'clock in the morning on the Saturday. So it's still 24 hours before the polls start. You've got Reuters saying, US far right activists, WikiLeaks, and bots help amplify the Macronics. There were, there were bots in there in the mix as well. So while the leaks themselves, while Twitter traffic about the leaks is still going on, and people are still wondering whether that's a story, and journalists are wondering whether they need to cover that. We've already got the facts out there that this is the far right in the US pushing this. Le Monde picked up the story, and they didn't focus on the leaks, they focused on the guy who was pushing them, who is the pro Trump militant who is amplifying the Macronics. The New York Times focused on the activists. I spent that whole weekend on the phone doing interviews from all over the world with people who were asking, tell us about this foreign interference in the French election. And the story that weekend was not scandal of leaks, torpedoes Macron. The story of that weekend was American far right tries to torpedo Macron. The whole tenor of the conversation changed because we, frankly, we were lucky. We'd been able to identify the players who turned out to be important. When we were looking at those posts back at the start, we didn't know what we were gonna be looking for, but then we found it. And again, it's that awareness, it's knowing the field you're working in, and then being able to tell, hey guys, this is what the story is. Sharing the how. It wasn't just telling the journalists, yes, I know who's doing it, it's being able to send the journalists, here's the first tweet, here's the second tweet, here's the third tweet, look at the timestamps for yourself. You can verify what I've done, they're tweets, they're out there. It's telling the story, this is about the far right who are interfering. Telling the story of this is how Russia faked the knocking out of the Mon Cook. And it's trusting the storytellers. If I had just tweeted about the whole Macron leaks thing, 
I mean, I might maybe would have got a couple of hundred retweets, but, but that's nothing. But I was able to trust Reuters with everything. I was able to give them, here are the tweets, here's the data, here are the numbers. And when Reuters put out the story, everybody gets it. So it's working out who are the trusted storytellers in your space and being able to work with them. Be showing them that they can trust you. It wasn't a coincidence that Reuters phoned me. We'd worked on stories, I'd given them quotes, I'd done analyses that they picked up on. We knew that we could trust each other. And I sent them the evidence as the proof. So you share the hand, you tell the story, and you trust the storytellers, and then they're the ones who have the reach into the population. It's not enough for me to say it, but it's when you have the journalists picking up on it, or you have, you have influencers and amplifiers picking up on it, and it reaches out into society. And then one person can tell the people they know, and that's how you can actually have an impact on the level of society itself. You can't go straight from government to all the people at once. You have to work out who the trusted voices are, you have to build trust with them, and then you have to show them this is how it works. You've got the four Ds, you've got the three A's, you've got reverse searching. The techniques are not that difficult. What counts is the trust and the storytelling. So I will be more than happy to shut up and take a few questions. So I mean, my background is as a Russian linguist, so my professional experience has mainly been with Russia. Um, what we've seen of China is that there's certainly been very heavy communication efforts, which includes this information around, for example, the South China Sea, um, and the, uh, the det detention centers for Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. That's where you really get the, the, the sharp end of the, of the, um, let's say the disinformation and, and propaganda attempts. At the moment, it looks like, more broadly, um, a lot of the Chinese effort is more on pushing positive messages about China than about pushing false messages about other people. So it's, it's putting the bright face on China, and a lot of it is about just not saying about the bad stuff. Um, there's also the, the fact with China that, that you're, you're looking at a different set of factors. You know, when, 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 you, when you're sitting on a, on a slush fund of dollars, which is like $3 trillion deep, you don't necessarily need a few, a few trolls, you just go and buy a politician. So, so there, are, there, there are many different channels of influence which are, which are in play with China. Information is one part of it, and it's part of the three warfares. It seems to be most important to them in issues which, let's say, closer to home, Xinjiang province, South China Sea. There's been a sudden uptick in, in online activity around the Huawei debate, and I suspect we're going to be seeing a lot more of that, and I suspect we'll be seeing very heavy attempts to influence politicians and public opinion as decisions on 5G start to kick in, as governments start to think, do we want Huawei to be actually providing our 5G infrastructure, or is that just too much of a security risk? So my personal expectation is that as that process goes on, we'll see more and more of this. But at the moment, the Chinese influence operations seem to have had a somewhat different thrust. Um, there's a very interesting parallel, if I may, with, with Iran, um, because we've seen quite a few exposures of Iranian influence operations, um, which, which started in about 2012 or 13. These are long running operations which started getting exposed last summer. Um, FireEye exposed a network of about a dozen websites. My team then exposed about a couple of dozen more. Reuters then worked on it and exposed about 70 more. This is a, a network of websites which very largely um, repurpose Iranian regime propaganda. So, so they'll, they'll take official outlets like Press TV or, or the Ayatollah's website, and they'll strip out the attribution, they'll pretend it's their own work, and then they will push it online and say, hey, here's the thing that we just wrote. Um, and they have been running hundreds of fake social media accounts. They posted over a million times on Twitter before they got taken down. Through, through most of its life, this was a fairly clumsy operation, and it was using social media to steer people towards the websites. Um, there was a Facebook takedown at the start of this week, uh, which was doing exactly that. We, we wrote on it at the time. So if you go to medium.com slash DFR lab, um, you'll see one of our latest pieces about the Iranian propaganda takedown. 
but last summer they were observed actually changing their tactics. So there were a batch of sites which were trying much harder to masquerade as individuals, particularly in America and, and the UK, um, and they seem to be targeting particular demographics and, and, and pretending to be members of that demographic, and they seem to be trying to engage more on platforms. So rather than just like posting links to websites, they were posting comments and trying to engage with people and being a bit more edgy. And it looks a lot like the Iranian operation was starting to copycat what the Russian operation had been doing. Now we don't have enough confirmation whether the whole operation has changed because, because the latest takedown from this week was kind of the old-fashioned way, it was just posting website links. So it's not yet clear whether that was a blip or that's going to be more of a trend. But certainly what we saw last year was the Iranian operation was, in part, much more similar to the Russian operation than they had been before. And, and frankly, my big concern is really, Russia is the best known example. Russia has never been the only problem. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more copycat operations going on. There have been reports in the US of both Democrat supporters and Republican supporters using similar techniques of using fake social media accounts to try and steer the other side towards weaker candidates. And my fear is that we're probably going to see more and more domestic actors doing this on the small scale just because they feel they can. And that, that's a big worry. Question just behind you. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for a great lecture. You probably haven't missed a big case here in Sweden about Martin Krag, uh, who has and the Institute for Spacecraft <laughs> and the Integrity Initiative, I would guess. Exactly. Yes. So, um, from what open, open, open Source suggests, um, we have a ERU leak uh, leading to RT Sputnik publications posting the narrative that he's a uh, uh, MI6 spy, and it made its way into Sweden's biggest publisher. And even with exposed to all of these facts, the publishers kind of still defend the publication and says, you know, this is relevant, but they also said this is cultural journalism, so we don't really need the fact things that other journalists do. Right. How would we what, what recommend what would you what would your recommendations be for Sweden? How would we deal with something like this? It is after all Sweden's biggest newspaper. Thank you very much. Sure. So um, for full disclosure, I worked at the Institute for Statecraft in 2016, um, and so I was there when the Integrity Initiative was being set up. Um, and for clarity, the Integrity Initiative was an idea of, if you think back to 2016, people have now woken up to the fact that Russian disinformation and influence operations are a thing. People in different countries are writing about it, but they're not really talking with each other. And so the idea of the Integrity Initiative was to bring together the different experts from different countries so they could actually like pool their knowledge. Okay. Um, so it was a, yeah, an entirely think tanky thing to do. The Institute for Statecraft got hacked at the end of last year, and a group calling themselves Anonymous, who writes English in a very peculiarly Russian kind of way, started leaking it online, um, uh, including my personal details, including my home address and bank details. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, and the allegation is that, that everybody who was named on any of the statecraft mailing lists must therefore have been paid by the UK government to smear Russia. So it's a very, if you think about the four Ds, this is D1, 2 and 3 all in the same time, right? It's dismissive. Don't listen to them because they're paid to smear Russia. Distort, well actually they're on a mailing list. It's not the same thing. Um, and distract. While you're accusing statecraft of being a troll farm, you're not actually talking about the genuine troll farms that we know about from Russia, because Russian journalists have been in there and reported on it. So it's D1, 2, and 3 all at the same time. Um, in the way of how Sweden can deal with it, when you're dealing with the free press, it's frankly tough. Um, and if the free press are saying, well, we don't have to do facts, that's really, really worrying. If they're pointing to the fact that, well, Kremlin propaganda outlets are saying this, that, that, that is a factual statement. If they are picking up on the fact themselves, on, on, if they are picking up on the allegation themselves and not actually adding in the fact, then at some point somebody used to say, bring the facts in here. Um, there's a very interesting situation in the UK right now. Uh, we have the, the national telecoms regulator called Ofcom, and it regulates all kinds of behavior on the airway waves. One part of it is broadcast standards, and a lot of that is to do with decency, and you know, you don't have you don't have swearing before 7 p.m. or whatever it is. Um, but part of it is also the rule that news must be reported with due accuracy and presented with due impartiality. And that's what anybody broadcasting in the UK or registered to broadcast in the UK. And so Ofcom have the power to actually sanction broadcasters which break that rule. And there's a really interesting difference between RT and Sputnik. RT is licensed by Ofcom, 
broadcast in the UK, and I mean, okay, it's been it's been found to have violated the Ofcom standards more than just about any other broadcaster in Britain over the last four years, and, and they're under threat of sanction at the moment for keeping on doing it. But historically, they they've actually played much more within the rules than Sputnik have, because in the UK the airwaves are governed by Ofcom, but online and print is not. And so you have rules of accuracy and impartiality which apply to, to TV and radio which don't apply to other platforms. And you can really see the difference. But ultimately, if you've got a big publication which is coming out with stuff which just doesn't match any of the facts, and it's presenting it as factual, that has to be called out. Somebody needs to point out saying, well, do you need to provide facts or sources, or you need to move that to the opinion page? If it's on the opinion page, I'm sorry, you can't touch it, it's their opinion. But if it's that kind of factual, if they're saying that Martin Clark is employed by MI6, they better have the documentary proof. And the fact that his name features on a mailing list is not documentary proof of him being paid. It's documentary proof that he's on an email list. And somebody needs to call that out and say, let's have the standards of evidence here. In the open source world, we stand or fall by our evidence. It's the evidence which is absolutely paramount. If they're saying he's paid by the intelligence services of a foreign government, then show all the evidence. Or apologize and admit that actually he was on a mailing list. Hello, thank you so much. Uh, I'm just curious about how uh, artificial intelligence may come to change uh, the difficulty of uh, identifying, for instance, bots and trolls. Uh, because in terms of like, uh, already right now there's a web page called thispersondoesnotexist.com yeah. which generates fake, really uh, reality, uh, real looking images of uh, uh, people. Yeah, long term AI is a very scary problem set. And I frankly don't know how, how we're going to deal with some of it. I mean, you're right that it's getting easier and easier to generate a convincing looking profile picture. Um, my gut feeling is that's actually going to be less useful for bot creation than for trolls. But the whole point of bots is they're mass produced, right? I mean, you, you, if you can buy 10,000 likes for $60 online, that's 10,000 bots which are going for less than 60 bucks. It's just not worth the investment to put time into creating them. Um, and with bots, it, the, the profile picture is a small part of, of identifying, but it's much more about the behavior pattern, the activity, the anonymity, the amplification. Um, but with troll accounts, it's going to be much more, much easier to create a fake persona. And you'll actually have different photos which back it up, and, and you know, you could create an entire friendship group, none of whom exist. That's worrying. Uh, the ability to manipulate videos is pretty worrying. I, I don't know how many of you have seen, there's a video doing the rounds from a couple of years ago where people use AI to make President Obama, then President Obama, say stuff he never actually said. And sure, you look at it and you think, no, that's not right. But that will be developing very quickly. So, so long term, AI is a real concern. To be fair, my sense is the platforms are pretty concerned about it as well. And so they are already looking for the cues that would tell you this is coming from AI rather than coming from an individual. So, so you have to factor in some of the countermeasures will be there already. Um, in the short term, my concern is actually much more about the copycats. It's not the artificial intelligence, it's the human ones. It's the humans who read, I mean, our kind of analyses, frankly, and the humans who read the press and think, well, the Russians did that, I can do that. I'm going to run a little troll farm targeting local politics in my area. And I think in the, in the short term, we're going to have to watch out for more and more people playing from the Russian playbook with no connection to Russia, no connection to the Kremlin, but just with bad intentions. So short term, you know, I, I'll leave the AI problem to the kind of five and ten year of planners. My concern is what's going to hit us in the next 18 months in terms of copycats. Thank you. No more questions? Yeah, one final. Well, I, I, I can't resist asking about Brexit. So, please, resist. could you comment if there have been any, been any looked into the issue of manipulation there? There have been various uh, reports. I, I haven't done the research myself, um, but that there are there are in-depth and worrying reports about the use of 
social media data to, to do very targeted advertising towards specific constituencies um, based on the, let's say, the inappropriate use of Facebook data, particularly the, the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal. On, on the day of the referendum itself, we know that the Troll Farm in St. Petersburg um, put a lot of effort into pushing the hashtag reasons to leave the EU. But frankly, that's a few thousand tweets on one day, and the big picture is irrelevant by that point. Um, so I haven't seen indicators of covert Russian activity. The, the, the overt Kremlin activity in favor of Brexit was massive. If you look at the pro-leave propaganda on sites like, like Sputnik particularly, because um, RT is covered by, by, by Ofcom, remember. If you look at Sputnik, it was randomly one-sided, anti-EU, and in favor of leaving. Um, but again, you know, what's the impact of Sputnik on the UK population? It's probably not that massive. So, so there, there, there are various different parts of the puzzle. Very hard to say, was any one of them in particular a game changer? Did they all add up to the same thing? Very, very unclear at this point. But certainly there, you know, there, there was a ground level of, of, of digital manipulation, online manipulation ongoing. But again, frankly, you know, I'm, I'm sure that if you look really carefully, you might find one or two slight lies told by some of the campaigners involved. Um, and so, yeah, there, there was quite overt disinformation on certain issues from certain campaign voices. And once you have that in public and out there with name of people behind it, again, you've got to ask the question, how much of a groundswell did the, the covert stuff on fringe platforms really cause? So there are all kinds of questions to ask about Brexit, but I don't get the feeling that the result of Brexit was due to foreign interference. There were dirty games played online, but there were dirty games being played everywhere. It was a very depressing time for democracy. Well, thank you so much, Ben. You certainly earned the title Digital Sherlock, <laughs> uh, as we have seen. Um, and the more serious side of it, I think it's also that uh, you have the mentality in order to do this, because it's not always uh, laughter and fun and uh, a boy scout or girl scout spirit. It's also, you meet a lot of resistance uh, out there too. So uh, I think I, that's what I will take with me. There are a lot of techniques and I think you have shown them and we will practice them after the coffee break here also. Everyone will get into work. Uh, but to, the resilience is in the, is in the mentality. I think that's an important message to, to take on for this seminar. So thank you so much for sharing. And we will now have a cafe, Swedish Fika, and